All right, good afternoon. Let me start with a senior personnel announcement. Uh, we're delighted to announce that the Secretary General has appointed Najat Roshdi of Morocco as his Deputy Special Envoy for Syria. She succeeds Hala Matar of Bahrain, to whom the Secretary General expresses his gratitude for her efforts and dedication in the search for peace in Syria. Ms. Roshdi brings over 20 years of experience in political affairs and international coordinations in conflict and post-conflict areas, including through her latest assignment as the Deputy Special Coordinator and Resident Humanitarian Coordinator uh, with the Office of the UN Special Coordinator in Lebanon. Lots more on the uh, online. This morning, the Deputy Secretary, sorry, the Secretary General addressed uh, via pre-recorded video message the Transforming Education Pre-Summit being held in Paris. He said that any solution to the world's problem starts with education, the greatest tool we have to fulfill and grow human potential. However, he said that there is currently a crisis of equity, quality, and relevance of education systems in many countries. He underscored that the Transforming Education Summit that will take place in September, uh, on ahead of the, just ahead of the opening of the General Assembly, must be a turning point gathering heads of states to lay out crystal clear terms, their promise, their plans to fundamentally transform education for the future. He urged leaders to make full use of the pre-summit to generate momentum and commitment so there is a breakthrough for learners and societies. The head of our peacekeeping mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Bintu Keita, briefed the Security Council this morning. She told council members that ongoing M23 and other armed group activities in the country's east threaten to reverse hard-won progress in security and stability in the DRC and the region. Ms. Keita called on the Security Council to lend its full support to the region's efforts to defuse the current diplomatic and security tensions. She also urged the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda to seize the opportunity of forthcoming summit to be hosted by President Lorenzo of Angola to resolve their differences through dialogue. Uh, and Ms. Keita, as a reminder, will speak to you at the Security Council stakeout uh, after uh, the Security Council is done with her. Uh, turning to the Central African Republic, um, where our peacekeepers there have launched a military operation against armed groups in Wanda Jale, which is about 175 kilometers south of the town of Birao. The mission said that people in this area have been deeply impacted by the recent arrival of armed groups in their community, many of whom, many of them were forcibly displaced and were living in very precarious conditions. Peacekeepers have managed to secure the city and operations are continuing today to allow displaced people to return to their homes. The mission says they are conducting robust day and night patrols as well as aerial surveillance missions. Our colleagues reiterate their call on armed groups to immediately lay down their arms to join the disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration programs and to refrain from any action that could harm the civilian population. Uh, another peacekeeping update, this time from Mali, uh, where I want to just give you a short update on what our peacekeeping colleagues are doing to improve the security in the center of that country. The head of the peacekeeping mission, El Gassim Wane, has just concluded a two-day visit to the Mopti region, where local communities have greatly impacted by recent attacks, but have been greatly impacted by recent attacks by armed groups. Mr. Wane and his team met with the governors, uh, local authorities, and community members in the villages of Bandiangara, uh, Ogusagu, and Yalasugu, where, as you were aware, many people have been killed or displaced recently. Discussions focus on how Malian authorities and the mission can collaborate to improve security and um, support social cohesion. The head of the peacekeeping mission also met it with Mo the Mopti governor to discuss the possibility of cooperation to reduce tensions related to farmer to farmer migration by creating a corridor um, for safe passage. He also held talks with the Malian armed forces to improve cross-border, regional, and international cooperation. He reiterated the mission's strong support for reconciliation efforts and stressed the need for continued dialogue between local communities. In Afghanistan, we, along with our partners, are continuing to provide humanitarian assistance following last week's earthquake. 
In the Jian district of Patika province, we provided nearly 900 families with food, tents, shelter, cash, water, and hygiene supplies. In the Barmal district, also in Patikta province, the International Organization for Migration and the UN Refugee Agency jointly made emergency shelter and other items available for 300 families. In neighboring Khost province, we and our partners provided cash and food to more than 200 families in the Spera district. All mobile health clinics run by UN humanitarian partners are operational in communities impacted by the earthquake. Our assessment found that the disaster impacted 2,000 families in Patikta and Khost provinces. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, note from you uh, regarding Ukraine. You'll recall the yesterday afternoon, Rosemary De Carlo, the head of our political affairs department, briefed Security Council on the situation in that country in a meeting. Uh, in a security, open Security Council um, meeting. She said the horrific conflict, an open source of instability in Europe, shows no sign of abating. Ms. DiCarlo recalled the attack on a shopping center in Kremenchuk in which 18 civilians were reportedly killed and 59 injured. The final toll may be much higher, she added. Meanwhile, she said, in scenes reminiscent of the Second World War, large-scale artillery duels are devastating industrial areas with thousands of civilians forced to hide in basements or to flee for their lives. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we are particularly concerned about the situation in uh, government and non-government controlled areas of the Luhansk Oblats, where our humanitarian colleagues are unable to deliver aid or support in any possible evacuations of civilians due to the ongoing fighting activities. Local authorities are telling us that nearly a dozen civilians were killed two days ago while lining up for water in Lysyshansk. Access to water and health care in these areas remained worryingly limited. Despite enormous challenges, we have reached almost 9 million men, women, and children with critical assistance since the start of the war. However, humanitarian needs outpace our resources. We again urge the parties to the conflict to protect civilians in Ukraine and to enable unimpeded safe access for humanitarian workers to support people everywhere. Thank you. And a quick update uh, from our team in Liberia, where the resident coordinator, Neil Scott, is reinforcing the national COVID-19 response by supporting partnerships, a COVID-19 steering committee, and multiple mass vaccination campaigns. As of the 24th of June, the country had received more than 4 million vaccine doses, with nearly 3.4 million of those coming through the COVAX initiative. More than 2.7 million Liberians received at least one dose of the vaccine, and over 2.2 million people have been fully vaccinated, which is 73% of the total target population age 12 or older. With support from UNICEF and the World Health Organization, Liberia ensured that high-priority groups, including 8,600 refugees, receive vaccines. Our team also worked with health authorities to provide persons with disabilities with technology services, including hearing aids, wheelchair spectacle prostheses, and devices to provide cognitive support. Our team also worked with the government to roll out distance learning programs and support national nutrition initiatives that reached nearly 37,000 children. Uh, speaking of food, a couple of reports I want to flag to you from the, our friends in Rome at the Food and Agriculture Organization. The first one is on the state of the world's fisheries, which finds that significant growth in aquaculture has driven up global fisheries and aquaculture productions to record high. As the sector expands, FAO says more, more transformative changes are needed to achieve a more sustainable, inclusive, and equitable fisheries and aquaculture sector. The second report is the agency's agricultural outlook for the next decade. The joint report underscores that the global agri-food sector faces fundamental challenges over the coming decade, particularly in the need to feed an ever-increasing population in a sustainable manner. The impacts of the climate crisis and the economic consequences and disruption to food supplies linked to the war in Ukraine. More information on FAO's inter website. And lastly, UN Habitat today released a report which says that rapid urbanization was only temporarily delayed by the pandemic, with the global urban population back on track to grow by another 2.2 billion souls 
by 2050. The large-scale flight from major cities in the early stages of the pandemic uh, to the perceived safety of the countryside or smaller towns was a short-term response that will not alter the course of urbanization globally. Despite greater incidence in the virus in urban areas and the economic difficulties created by the pandemic, cities are once again serving as beacons of opportunities to people in search of employment, education, training, and taking refuge from conflict. Idi. Uh, thank you, Steph. A couple of questions. First, uh, does the Secretary General have any comment on the uh, resurgence of religious tensions in India today. We've seen the death of a Hindu man. Well, we, we very much hope, uh, we call on for the full respect of all religions uh, and for ensuring uh, throughout the world that different communities can live in, in harmony and in peace. Um, secondly, um, Hong Kong has barred some journalists from attending the 25th anniversary of the handover uh, from British rule to China. Uh, there's a big ceremony. I believe Xi Jinping is going to be there. Does the Secretary General have any I, comment I, I on haven't that? seen those particular reports, but I will refer you to what I said yesterday uh, concerning journalists, uh, is that we believe that wherever in the world, journalists should be able to ply their trade freely. And thirdly, um, the ASEAN envoy to Myanmar has begun a trip to Myanmar. Uh, is there any uh, discussion of um, UN envoy Nolene Heiser um, visiting Myanmar? There's no update on that, but obviously we remain in very close touch uh, with our ASEAN partners on this. Ms. Salome. A couple questions. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, hearing some reports that the Secretary General had a phone conversation with uh, Sergei Lavrov. Uh, do you have any updates on food negotiations? Uh, the reports are indeed true. Uh, the Secretary General spoke to Foreign Minister Lavrov, I think at about 10 o'clock uh, this morning. Um, it would not surprise you to know that they discussed the situation in Ukraine, including uh, efforts to get Ukrainian grain and Russian grain and fertilizer back onto the global market. Any uh, assurances, no, any developments that you can, any no, you can tell us that's to, reported uh, that Lavrov promised to make transmission I mean, safer? He, the Secretary General, as, as I said, is spending quite a lot of time on the phone, uh, as uh, are uh, Mr. Griffiths and Ms. Uh, Greenspan, uh, when we have something to announce, we shall announce it. Uh, if I may, a second you may. question. Uh, also some reports out of Gaza that UNRWA has suspended five workers for social media posts related to the Palestinian situation. Do you have any comment, no, any knowledge I, of that? I, I, don't any any, I don't have any comment because I don't have any information, but we'll check with our colleagues at UNRWA. Thank you. Edward. Hi, Steph. Just one question on Ukraine. Two updates. First, Syrian Arab Republic recognized independence and sovereignty of Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics. And the second, the um, Russian-controlled Kherson is reported to prepare a referendum on joining Russia. Any comments on the two news? Uh, on the first part, uh, and frankly on the second part, uh, our position is clear. We are guided by the relevant General Assembly resolution, uh, which uh, underscores the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Uh, what about the first part? Well, that's, that's a question you need to ask uh, the Syrians. That's not an issue for us. Uh, Alan. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, NATO uh, just adopted a new strategic concept uh, in which they recognize Russia as a direct threat to the alliance. And uh, uh, for the first time, uh, NATO is no longer re uh, considering Russia as a partner. 
do you, I mean, does the UN believe that uh, such a decision will exacerbate uh, the, the tensions in Europe? Um, look, we, we can't, I, you know, I'm not speaking for NATO. What we are, uh, what the Secretary General is looking for and what he's been working towards is trying to see how global tensions can be lowered. Abdullah. Uh, thank you, Steph. I have a question regarding uh, Sudan, the Sudanese situation. Uh, the Sudanese Foreign Ministry summons the head of the United Nation, Nations mission and informs him of its dis dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction with his statement regarding tomorrow's protest and demonstration. Any comment on that? I haven't been briefed. Our, our uh, position on, uh, on the demonstrations that have been taking place uh, in Sudan is the same we've said in many places, is that people have a fundamental right to demonstrate uh, peacefully and that authorities, wherever they are, need to do whatever they can to ensure that that right is respected and protected. Yes, Alan. Um, Louis. This is a follow-up to what Edie asked, and also to you're, you're, If you could put your microphone a little closer. Sorry. That's OK. Uh, this is a follow-up to what uh, Edie asked, and also to uh, what you said yesterday about uh, the Indian journalist who was, uh, uh, who's, who's charged with uh, hurting religious sentiments, the same charge that uh, the ruling party spokesperson who's been suspended also faces. Uh, how do you square that with uh, the call for respect for all religions and should that apply to all religions in terms of journalists' comments? We, we believe in the fundamental right of expression. We believe in the fundamental right of, ju of journalists uh, to express themselves. And we also believe in the fundamental need uh, for people to respect uh, other communities and other religions. And we don't believe the two are, uh, are uh, we believe those two statements are very much compatible. OK. Edward. OK, since we have already talked about NATO. Uh, in NATO's strategic concept, they also regarded China as the systematic challenges. Um, a organization called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization whose members has launched wars over years, said China, who hasn't launched any military operation, I mean, for almost four decades, a systematic, a systematic challenges. Do, uh, does the UN feel it hypocritical or a double standard? And you just mentioned the Secretary General wants to lower tensions uh, in, in, the, in the globe. Do you think this kind of concept will lower the tension okay. in the world? <laughs> I, I'm not an analyst and I'm not a comment uh, machine. I can only tell you what our position is and what we are trying to do. I will leave it to you to, to analyze and to uh, underscore what you may think are contradictions and, 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 and so on. But I, I'm not going to do a paragraph by paragraph analysis of NATO's uh, strategy. I can only tell you what the Secretary General's uh, efforts are, which is to uphold uh, the uh, the ideals of the Charter and to work uh, to lower uh, global tensions uh, everywhere, to be redundant. Alan. Speaking about freedom of press, uh, yesterday President Zelensky, after his speech in the Security Council, <clears throat> Uh, made a statement, video statement, in which he threatened the journalists who, quote unquote, um, justify the uh, actions of Russian army in Ukraine. He said that they will be punished. Uh, any comments regarding such a statement free towards journalists? Fr fr freedom of the press is freedom of the press. And it applies uh, for us uh, universally um, around the world in 193 member states, and those principles uh, remain unchanged and unbowed. Okay. Let's go eat. Bon appetit. See you tomorrow.